We are going to hear now Professor Martin Erter. Just going to your presentation is here. That's it. This this one. This is the first. No, 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 no. This is not. Okay, I'm going to introduce you. Okay. So. Now we are going to hear Professor Martin Erter. Again, you all know him. Uh, he hosted with Andreas Lowe uh, 10 years ago now in Freiburg, uh, the Shared Decision Making Conference. And it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome you here, Martin. Thanks a lot. And, uh Merci, Nora. Bonjour. Uh, good morning to the, uh, today to everybody. Nora, wait a moment. <laughs> I have a present for you because um, I think the, the volume we produced together wasn't, didn't arrive in time. So this is the first for you and another present for her is relaxing music after the conference. <laughs> <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Yes, hopefully we don't run out of time. So I have, I guess, 20 minutes, a little bit more left. Uh, my, my task or oh, my, my idea was to think about also, like Amiram thought about, what is, uh, what, what can you say after 20 years, after Cathy Charles and Amiram Gaffney's paper. And um, I tried to focus a little bit about the international accomplishments and what are our future challenges uh, in the next years. Um, so I will also start with the two papers and I just recommend to you to read, read the papers. I did it before the conference and I think uh, these papers have been so wise. There's written almost everything we try to implement and we know how difficult is it to implement. But the questions I would raise and I always like very much the title of the first paper especially in brackets, or it takes at least two to tango. But then I started to reflect, because if you are looking to this BMG, BMJ issue, and you see this couple of men and women, and you try to transfer it into medical practice, maybe we have some difficulties. <laughs> I'm not sure who is the doctor, and I'm not sure if doctors really like to be so full of passion, so full of emotion. So maybe this picture is not the right one. So that's a question again. I, I like it very much, but maybe it's not the right image to say this is shared decision making. I think we, we all agree more or less, and Amiram already told us about that, it's a continuum. So the decision between paternalistic and informed uh, shared, uh, and shared decision making in the middle, but there, there are nuances, so there are ty types of encounters in between. But I think we also agree what's important, it's making a decision together, patients should be encouraged about the uh, available screening treatment or management op options and so on, and then they can commu communicate their preferences and help select the best course of action. So there are many different definitions, but I think Mostly we agree about uh, this model and the continuum. But then we have difficulties to measure it. And there was one idea how to try to measure this kind of continuum. And you all know the control preference scale tries a little bit to, to operationalize the preferences of patients. We all know the, the, the pros and cons of this scale, but it shows C should be the shared decision a making model and A, B is more on the paternalistic side and D, you know, D and E is more on the paternalistic side and A and B more on the information side. When you try to measure it, uh, and we, we did it in a sample of really a representative cancer patient sample in, in, in Germany, just to see how is the tendency of patients already in care, and you see more or less um, threefold uh, picture, so there are still a lot of patients who say it's maybe better if I take the recommendations of, of the doctor. So I, I really like uh, the doctor to make the decision. There are fewer than on the SDM or the information model. And as you see here in the bracket, it's not clear. Is, is the middle one, so the D and the B, 
is that also shared decision making? So it's the continuum which is important. And calling it shared decision making is maybe also a question to raise because we are modeling the encounter in between autonomy and less autonomy. I think we agree almost on what is uh, the, uh, the type of decisions about whether to undergo screening or diagnostic tests. That's a classical shared decision making question or every medical or surgical procedure or take medications, but also more difficult ones because this is a process participating in a self-management program for long-term conditions or psychological interventions or also attempting to change lifestyle or also the question, is it better in or outpatient treatment interventions than end of life uh, interventions? You, and you all can imagine these are very different decisions and maybe we need very different types of encounters to resolve the problem, what is right for the patient. I think many would agree also that evidence-based medicine, we talk about RCTs and meta-analysis guidelines, is a very solid base for shared decision making. But on the other side, we know that patient-centered communication skills are very necessary then to do shared decision making, to reach at a point where we could say this is optimal patient care. So we need both evidence-based medicine knowledge but then also patient-centered communication skills to do shared decision-making. And maybe a larger picture, and we did this uh, with Isabella and her group uh, together uh, several years ago to think about patient-centered care, because many are talking about patient-centered care and shared decision-making. Maybe shared decision-making, I just highlighted in red, is only one part of an approach where we could say these are all very important dimensions for patient-centered care. So activities in blue, principles in yellow, and enablers in, in orange. So if you look to the principles, this is all patient-centered communication, the characteristic of the patient, the biopsychosocial perspective, the clinician-patient relationship, which is important, and then the clinician-patient communication as an enabler. But then you have to think about also access to care, how to coordinate and to con continue care, teamwork building and team building and so on. And maybe one part of it, of this approach to patient-centered care is the patient involvement activities in care, involvement of family and friends and patient information. But it's only one part to realize patient-centered care. In other words, it's a bigger picture where shared decision-making and patient-centered care come together. There are challenges. Um, this is a very nice picture like from the Annals of Internal Medicine because we know doctors are overloaded sometimes and, and with bureaucracy, documentation, guideline reading. So this is a picture of today's doctor-patient -patient relationship. Is it like that? So no time for doctors to have time for encounters with patients or even worse, another challenge you know, we all know there are people who say we don't need any more maybe doctors because the, the computer is doing the right decision for the patient. Precision medicine, big data, if we have the personalized data of a patient, these data will, say, will tell us this is the right way for this patient and in the, and in the other way <coughs> is the right way for the other patient. But hopefully many think um, as this person <coughs> is thinking that's not the solution. So medicine can be based on all the data and algorithms alone, but we don't know. We don't know the future. Trust is what enables a doctor to help a patient cope with this chronic condition or to engage in end-of-life discussion. And trust is dependent on real relationships. So the combination may be big data, the help of more information than trust and relationship will help um, and they complement to one another. So the question is reflecting after 20 years, where are we now regarding patient-centered care and shared decision-making? And I just list uh, the, the conferences again when we started. Uh, very few of us have been in Oxford, but then more in, in Swansea, which was the first <coughs> official conference, and we are now in Lyon. And if, if you just look at the titles, so I think from 2005 to, yeah, to Lima almost, 
We already struggled with the question of the implementation. We, we changed title, but it was always the question implementation, implementing, translating, provision to reality. So we are struggling since many years with uh, this issue. But I think we accomplished also a lot and just highlight the three conferences where we produced uh, this type of international status quo. And as you see, if you do shared decision making, you are not becoming older. Just look to the pictures. We are very young, we are growing, we are coming ladies to the editorial team. So it's a lovely work. And, and if you see, in 2007 we had seven countries, and then 2011, 14 countries contributing. Now we have 22 countries who, uh, which contributed to this uh, special issue, and we, we know there are many other countries already doing something, so it's, the field is growing, the field steps forward. I just took a look into publications, just numbers, and that's, these are two graphs. One is, um, SDM in the title, so we can say these are probably really contributions with shared decision making focusing 1000 in 10 years, and SDM is a topic in the keynotes and uh, in, in the keywords 4000 in, in, in the 10 years. And you see there's a really grow of publications, so scientific activity is very good. These are the countries uh, just try to color and to map where other countries from, and the two, 22 contributions that you see in blue, the names of the countries, countries which are new in the new volume, uh, which you will see, receive today, hopefully. And you see, and, and we are very happy that Africa contributed as uh, the first climb, and we have uh, many contributions from Asia, and I think this is very important to see how the field is developing. I just took an, a, a look into the contributions and I was uh, thinking about can we say something in general or where are we standing, what is the status quo of patient centered care and shared decision making. I, I took these six criteria to a little bit evaluate the status quo in shared decision making patient centered care. So how about policy initiatives, uh, are there patient laws, leadership, clinicians or supporting institutions, how about tools, how many countries are producing tools and how many countries are already uh, doing uh, skills and capacity training courses and medical schools and so on and research activities and what, what is described in the papers and, and are there any demonstration sites. It's a very personal qualitative and semi-qualitative analysis of the 22 contributions so I read them carefully and I tried to extract uh, what we can see. And you see these are 22 uh, countries uh, always and you see uh, immediately where we are maybe strong and it's clear the number five research groups because all the papers have been uh, written by research groups. Uh, this is the most active part in the world. And we see also and then I think that it's important that many countries have something about law of the political support is there, also institutional support, even if some countries say we don't have or we are not sure there are only first activities. But you see also, and maybe that's a, a very important focus for us, and we know, you just can see it again, decision tool development, training development and implementation are still uh, tasks where we have a lot to do. Yeah? So these three tasks are, are still uh, yeah, you, see, you can see them on the international level if you're read, reading uh, carefully the papers. So um, I used this uh, slide which was um, shown, I think, uh, for the first time in, in Maastricht and to think about, uh, to reflect where are we regarding definition, measurement, interventions, implementation, again, and I think there has been a, a lot of conceptual work, extensive conceptual work. We heard about the first step with the SDM model and then I show you again the, the choice and option decision uh, talk and model and I think there has been more developments. We have seen the, the, the Picasso from Amira now. There's enlarging uh, and questioning again if, if we are focusing just on the classic curative approach or if it's a broader approach and if we need uh, different models like merging goal setting and SDM action planning and so on. And uh, I came across the, this very interesting publication which is focusing not more, uh, not anymore on the medical encounter but on the process of many encounters. So 
the view of Marla Clayman and Paul Goodbranson, a patient in the clinic, so the person in the world, why share decision making needs to center on the person rather than the medical encounter? So it's another view of shared decision making. What does it mean across uh, the long term condition? What does it mean for encounters? So it's not just one. We have to reflect about the process in, in different encounters. We know that many patients would say, yes, I have been involved, but many also would say, and this is from Angela and the UK paper, you see the statistics more or less, 50% would say in the UK, yes, I have been involved as much as you, as I wanted in decisions. We don't know if the anchor is the right one, because this question is difficult to answer for patients, because Often patients don't know what they can expect, but this is, these are the data. I just show you because you show, and uh, the, the, the graph shows there is still a lot of improvement uh, in the UK, but if you look into German data, this is again the representative sample of cancer patients. 50% would say, yes, it was high, I was highly involved in, in care decisions, but then moderate or low, so it's again 50%. There's, there's room for improvement. And we know also, and it's difficult how to measure it, if it's uh, the patient, so SDMQ9 is the patient side, or it is the doctor uh, assessing the, uh, the consultation, or is it an external rating, like the option say, and the scale we see, and uh, this is a, a publication from many years ago, there's not a lot of correlation between the three perspectives. So the question is again, how can we measure if SDM has happened or not? And there are similar results in, in different uh, publications. So sometimes it seems we can see the wood for the trees in SDM. So where, where, where do, we, do we have to go? So maybe we need some light to shed light what's, what's clear, what's not clear to, um, to improve our steps in research. I think important is, and all, all of you know, uh, that we have again the update of the Cochrane Library, which is important to see what, is, uh, the, what are the main outcomes. Uh, and we know increase in knowledge, accuracy of risk perception, and the congruency, and so on, and decrease. That's well known. And we know also, doesn't mean that the consultation should be longer. There's maybe lower costs. And we see there's no difference in anxiety levels and general out outcomes and no adverse events are reported in the trials. And we know also from uh, the, the update, the research needs. We need more research on adherence. We need maybe more research on cost effectiveness of this type of intervention and use in other populations, in lower, lower literacy populations, for example. We know from another uh, important uh, contribution uh, regarding training health professionals that is still growing the production of SDM training programs uh, worldwide but they're still very very widely uh, between lengths and dosage and content so we are not clear what's the right way to train doctors or students it's the most of the trainings are focused on the single provider, not on interprofessional factors, and very few, too few, are evaluated. This is the status quo in training. And maybe you would agree that uh, decision-making, so on the lower side, the SDM process needs conditions or preconditions before you can do really very well SDM. Clinician's attitude, so the Rogerian variables, empathy, positive regard, congruence, how the doctor is acting, how the doctor or the team is perceiving uh, the patient, and how is the, on the technical side the communication done, ask, asking questions, active listening, motivational interviewing, responding to emotions, verbalizing, paraphrasing. So a lot of skills are needed before you can do really a professional decision-making um, encounter. And I think we are struggling how to do that in training or in medical school. This is just a model just to show you that we are using it as an idea of we need more than only shared decision making skills. Uh, so you see it, it's here from the Hamburg Medical School. It's just one 
module and one skill training in, in a different set of, of skills training which are important for them to learn. So on the, on the basis you need a basic skill training and communication like active listening and if you can't do that you can go to the next step and then the shared decision making behavior change counseling and at the end before you leave medical school maybe you are capable to uh, also talk to patients who are dying. Yeah? So these are different modules in a in a longitudinal track a curriculum of communication. We know from uh, important work, I would say, from uh, Magic in the UK, uh, the challenges we are um, meeting when we are trying to implement uh, these tools, training, decision tools uh, into practice. And I uh, took out the challenges they ask, and I think these are the typical questions. We do it already, the answer of doctors. We don't have the right tools. Patients maybe don't want SDM, and it's difficult to measure it, and we have too many other demands. These are the five challenges, and I think um, MAGIC gave a lot of very good and short answers to these questions, how to address it. So, skills work better than theory and presentations to introduce the concept to doctors or to teams. Very important, we don't have the right tools. Attitudes, so the attitude of the clinician is more important than skills. So the basis are really attitudes versus the patient. Patients don't want SDM, so patient activation preparation can increase, so we have to focus also on the patient. And there's a tension, and I think this is very important about the discussion, certification, quality assurance issues. We need, from the research side, we would say, we need psychometrically really valid and reliable measures. And, and on the other side, the QA, people would say, we need good measures for quality assurance, issues of quality improvement. There's a tension between these two tendencies. And too many other demands, so we need effort at all, and maybe that's the, the biggest struggle, how to do that effort at all organizational levels. So the organization should be really integrated into implementation processes. The last question is, where do we want to be regarding patient-centered care and shared decision-making? So again, what are the needs? So we need more thinking about uh, research, and we are research and clinicians, uh, need for studies on psychometrics and multiple perspectives, and the timing. Think about back to the encounter. What do we measure? Timing and the longitudinal aspects of measuring shared decision-making. Well, in the, in the intervention, on the intervention side, a lot of work, we know all this done on PTDAs, but we, we need more tra training research and we need more consens consensus, I think. If you re uh, remember, there's a wide range of training courses, but we don't reach um, at the consensus what is necessary, what is the, con the necessary content and maybe also the intensity of training. That, that means we need more evaluation on that and more research. And I think implementation, the, the last step, um, also I would say, um, let's exchange a little bit more uh, precisely, more effectively also, what are really steps to go in, uh, in implementation. Several countries have tried to implement shared decision-making patient-centered care, so we need more joint efforts, we need more exchange and learning from each other to implement good programs. I just want to remember also a very important publication I came across when I was uh, this year in the Salzburg Global Seminar. Maybe you remember the Salzburg Statement on Shared Decision Making. And this paper is describing where we could be, uh, the utopia, healthcare, the land, people power, and there are a lot of uh, other aspects, again, uh, which are important where we can, uh, um, yeah, try to reach nothing about me was uh, without me was written here and I think they had a lot of very nice ideas and it's another very important group um, where we discussed it uh, this year uh, about open notes so the, the access of patients to their electronic records which is also a very important empowerment strategy so at the end some suggestions which are not new, but I think I focused a little bit where I think we should um, go. So I think every representative form from, from the different countries, think about how can you stimulate reform of your training environment, undergraduate, postgraduate, or continuing professor development curricula. 
how can we further develop already existing short and valid measurement tools for clinical communication and implementation questions, how can we pair our patient-centered care and SDM programs with programs to evaluate the impact and uh, the success of these interventions. We should think about, again, how to share better tools, especially for non-English speaking people. We should not reinvent the wheel and we should think before we produce tools. Can these tools maybe also adapted to other cultural environments? And an important point I would say, um, we have to think really carefully because we are running out and outdated the important steps and websites we had like Ori, Ibdos and, and also other uh, data warehouses. They are, uh, we need an international warehouse but to collect all the international efforts and tools. And the third one, which is more linked to people who are engaged in clinical uh, guideline development, then think about how can we better link decision tools and clinical guidelines because this is another potential implementation level uh, on the medical side and facilitate access to decision aids. Many of you are thinking about uh, e-health in IT or clinical systems. So at the end, um, I would say it's more than two to tango. So again, the questioning the picture is the tango the white one to decide or do we need more? And I think we need more people to decide that, yeah, let's decide here in Lyon how to best join our forces for a strong international network and a powerful association. Thanks for listening. Just to echo what you said, two things. Uh, the first one is that you will see, and I think you already saw in the program, lots of parallel sessions are focused on training, on shared decision making measures, and on decision aids. Not meaning um, that the others are not important, <laughs> really, no, but we had lots of abstracts. And we receive, you know, the majority of abstracts on these topics and these three topics. So uh, do not miss these uh, sessions. And to echo uh, your last uh, slide, uh, tomorrow between noon and one, uh, there will be an open discussion on the future of our ISDM community. So you are all welcome. I think, I'm not sure, but you will check in the program that it will be here. Uh, but you are all welcome. So feel free to join us uh, to be able to exchange on uh, the future of our uh, community. Uh, we have maybe two or three minutes for questions or, or comments on Martin's presentation and then it will be time to work. Uh, so if you have uh, one or two comments, feel free. Or otherwise, let's go to, to parallel sessions. A question there? Okay. And I think this area of philosophy which links with medicine is quite a useful area to explore. And I think in the previous talk as well, there was something about the shared encounter and shared information and also shared knowledge and the knowledge of the different people, the doctor, the patient and the team and the family and the knowledge of the community. So I was just wondering if there was any ideas around those two areas coming together. Thank you. There are. Thank you very much. But I think it's a, it's a, a, a bigger discussion, and I, I will not. Uh, I, 
I don't think that it makes sense to try to answer your question, but I think in many countries there is an overlap between yeah, these, these philosophical questions and maybe more encounter questions than ethical issues. Yeah, and we can discuss it later if you like. But okay, I think we have to do it. We'll go to a session. I think we have a session. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. I mean, thanks, Mark.